Hey everyone, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to test out the Amazon Fire TV Stick 4K Max. Now this just came out maybe a week or two ago, and to be honest, everyone knows what an Amazon Fire Stick is. These are great little budget devices that allow you to stream all sorts of media. But the thing is, this most recent version has some pretty good specs. So today we're going to test it out and see how it actually performs as a retro gaming machine. Of course, all the things that a Fire Stick is known for, you know, streaming Netflix and Disney Plus and Hulu and things like that, they're still completely relevant on this device. And it plays things in 4K and HDR, and it also has Wi-Fi 6, so you have a much more stable connection. But this isn't going to be a review of any of those capabilities. We're really just going to look at how it performs for gaming. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to set up RetroArch and other emulators, and then also how to put your games on here, and then we'll see how they perform. And honestly, the amount of value that I got out of this thing at $55 for its retail non-sale price is kind of crazy. Like this is probably one of the better deals you can find out there. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised at what it can play. So without any further delay, let's see what this thing can do. Okay, so this device runs for $55 when it's not on sale, but you know, this thing goes on sale very often. For example, on Black Friday, I would expect this to drop down to something like maybe even $45 or $40. So definitely keep an eye out for that. I'm not going to dive too much into the specs because they're well documented, but it does run a quad-core 1.8GHz CPU. It has a 750MHz GPU, 8 gigs of onboard storage, the Wi-Fi 6 I was telling you about earlier, Bluetooth 5.0, as well as 2 gigs of RAM. And if you want to see more about what it can do when the whole streaming side of things, then definitely check out the listing on Amazon. But let me show you how to set it up for gaming. Like I mentioned before, it only has 8 gigs of storage, so that's not going to be enough if you're actually going to put on something other than, say, Game Boy or Nintendo games. So what we're going to use is this USB flash drive right here. This one here is 128 gigs, and I got it for $14. And that'll be plenty for most of the games we want to play. You're also going to want to have an OTG adapter like this. It's going to split the signal. This costs another $5. So we're looking at about additional $20 to get all this set up. All right, let's see what's inside the box. So first is the Fire Stick itself. And really, there's not a lot to talk about here. It just has the one single micro USB input. Other than that, there is no other I.O. Obviously, the stick itself has HDMI out, but that's really it. So what else do we got? Micro USB cable. It also comes with a remote. I've heard good things about this remote. It works with Alexa, so you can use it by voice, things like that. It's kind of interesting that Disney Plus has its own button now. It also comes with an HDMI extender in case the stick doesn't fit in your TV. And for the bookworms, it does come with a small manual. Other than that, you got a couple batteries that come for the remote, as well as the USB adapter. This is 5 volts, 1 amp. Okay, so let me give you an idea of what it's going to look like once you have everything set up. Obviously, you're going to have your Fire TV stick, and then you're going to use this OTG splitter here to plug the micro USB side in. Connecting the two together, you're going to have that USB drive here, and then you'll plug in the power cable into the other side of that OTG splitter. And that's basically the full setup. Of course, if you're going to use the HDMI adapter, you're going to want to use that one too. But that's really it. That's what it's going to look like. Not the prettiest thing in the world, but it's functional. Now, something I learned about this whole experience is that Amazon Fire Sticks actually have something that protect it from being able to be recorded. So even though I got the boot up splash logo, after that, nothing worked. So unfortunately, you're going to have to watch my footage here from my monitor. And I did my best to make it look pretty so it's not unpleasant to the eye, but fair warning, the autofocus on my camera isn't perfect. Either way, the picture is not going to look quite as good as it normally would when I'm capturing footage, but I think you'll still be impressed. So let's talk about the Fire TV operating system experience. This is what it looks like. It's just like your typical streaming device interface. You can go through and browse through your streaming apps or whatever apps they already have preloaded on here. Honestly, I'm not going to focus on this stuff too much. There's so many other channels and videos out there about this. But let me show you how to install emulators. There's no special trick to this. We're not going to hack the Kindle or anything else like that. We just need to access them. First thing you do is go into the Find Then App Store section, go into All Categories, and then find the category named Utilities. Within here, the very first app you'll find is one called Downloader. And this is it. You basically just install this app. This is going to allow you to browse the internet and download APKs, which you can then install directly onto the device. No hacking or anything else required. 
So once you've installed this app, it's going to ask you some file permissions. Are you sure you're going to want to allow it to access your photos, things like that? Just go ahead and hit OK. And this is the main downloader interface. Just go into the search bar here and then search for whatever you want. Let's start with RetroArch. And searching for the word RetroArch is going to give you a Google results page. And the first available option is going to be RetroArch itself. It's a little bit weird to navigate with the mouse interface using a remote, but you can get there. Once you get to the RetroArc page, just hit the hamburger icon and then select the word Downloads. Like I warned you, the autofocus on my camera isn't perfect. Either way, once you get there, just go ahead and scroll down until you find the Android symbol, and then you'll have several different options available here. Now personally, I tested out the 64-bit version of RetroArc. It doesn't work, so just grab the one that says Download. It'll take a minute to download this 155 meg file. After that, you can go ahead and install it. It may give you some permission questions. Just go ahead and grant whatever permission or accesses it needs. Once it's complete, go ahead and hit Done, and then it'll actually ask you if you want to delete the file afterwards. And I recommend, yes, delete that file. You're not going to need it. Now, if you go over to the right, right before the Settings, there's an Apps button here. You can click on that, and at the very bottom, RetroArch is going to appear. First thing you're going to want to do is start up RetroArch and give it access to your external storage and then let it extract the base APK file. This is going to improve your fonts and everything else. And there we are. Now we have RetroArch fully loaded onto this device. So now we're ready to actually add games. First thing you want to do is actually quit out of RetroArch. And if you haven't already plugged in the USB flash drive, you can go ahead and do that now. Okay, and once it's plugged in, go over to the settings section and then select My Fire TV. And within here, you're going to see a section that says USB Drive. And in there, it should show you that there is a USB Drive available. It'll give you the options to eject the USB or format to internal storage. You actually don't need to do any of these things. This is just a confirmation that it's plugged in and working. So what we're going to do now is actually unplug that USB Drive and stick it into your computer. Now we're going to load it up with games. You'll see that the drive initially has an Android folder, and you're not going to really need to use that. Just go ahead and make a new folder called Games. And within here, we're going to put all of our game files. I already have a game collection here, which includes things like BIOS files, as well as all the ROMs that I want to test out with. And of course, because of copyright, you're going to be on your own to source all of these files. Biggest thing is you're going to want to make sure you find a RetroArch BIOS pack and add that to your folder. And then from there, pick whatever systems you want to emulate. This video here is going to show you which perform the best, and that'll help you make your decisions. Either way, I'm just going to move the whole gamut over here because I'm going to be testing a bunch of these. And really, it's about as simple as that. We're actually going to point RetroArch to these folders here later on in the video. You don't have to do any sort of special organization. I would just make one folder per every system you want to play. And depending on the speed of the USB flash drive, this might take a while. For example, with me, it took about 30 minutes to move everything over. But I knew that going in, I have a 2.0 USB drive. It was super cheap, but this is what you pay for. Now, another thing you're going to want to have besides this USB drive and all your games is a controller to play them with. And really, any Bluetooth controller is going to work fine. You could use a PS4, or even a PS5 controller, Xbox One, things like that. No problem. Personally, I'm going to use the 8 bitdo SN30 Pro. This one's got all the buttons that I need, and I like the retro feel of it. The D-pad and the buttons just feel really good. And honestly, I kind of like the idea of this thing sitting at my coffee table. I'm just imagining a friend coming over and saying, Hey, what's that controller for? And I say, Oh, to play retro games on my Fire Stick. And they're going to be like, Whoa, show me how to do this. And you're going to show them this video. Okay, back to the matter at hand. Once you have all your games on the USB drive, plug that back into the Fire Stick, and now let's hook up that controller. You're going to go over to Settings, and then Controllers and Bluetooth Devices. Within here, there's a Game Controller section, and just select Add a New Controller. And within here, start your pairing mode on your controller, and then just pair it up like you would any other Bluetooth device. And so now that I'm connected, I can use the controller in everything, even the menu here, I'm using the controller. So let's go ahead and boot up RetroArch and get going. Before we start testing games, let me show you a few configuration tips so that way you have the best performance possible. First thing I recommend you do is go into the settings and then go all the way down to the settings menu and find the directory section. And we're going to change a few of these paths. For example, for system BIOS, we're going to go in here and then we're going to select storage. And then you'll have a combination of numbers and letters. That's your USB drive. Then I'm going to find games and then BIOS and then use this directory. Now RetroArch knows where to find my BIOS pack. Additionally, I'm going to scroll down a bit and go to the File Browser section. I'm going to default this to the Games folder. So I'm going to go Storage, USB Drive, Games, use this directory. And that's really it. This is going to make navigating everything much easier. Anytime you make a big system change like this, go into Main Menu, Configuration File, and Save Current Configuration. This is going to save things anytime you open up RetroArch. Another thing I recommend you do is go into Settings, then Input, and then let's set our hotkeys. 
First thing, you want to set your hotkey enable button. I typically like to use the select button, so I'm going to hold down on select here and then choose that. Next, I'm going to set up fast forward. I like to use R2 for this. Then for load state, I use L1 and save state, I use R1. For close content, I use the start button. And then for rewind, I use L2. And finally, for reset game, I like to use the B button. Show FPS as the Y button and then the menu toggle for the X button. Again, sky's the limit on what you want to choose here, but that's what I do. Once you've got all that set up, make sure you go back to main menu, configuration file, save current configuration. Okay, next thing, go into settings, user interface, and then menu item visibility. And then you'll get down here where it says things like show explore and favorites and images and music. I like to turn a lot of these off because then I don't have to see them in the menu. It's really going to be up to you whether or not you want to show favorites or you want to have net play enabled. Either way, go through here and toggle off all the ones you don't want to see. And again, go into main menu, configuration file, save current configuration. Okay, I think that's enough tweaking. Now that we've got everything set up, let's go ahead and quit RetroArch and jump back into it. And you'll see that the menu now is a little bit more streamlined. There's not so many things on the left here. So now let's start adding some playlists. We'll go into import content, then manual scan. Now just set whatever parameters you want. We're going to go into content directory. I'm going to pick Game Boy Advance here, then use this directory. Under system name, I'm going to scroll down to Nintendo and Game Boy Advance. Again, sorry about the autofocus. But under default core, you're going to see that you don't have anything, and that's because I forgot to download the course. So let's go back and download some cores now. You're going to go back into the main menu, go into online updater, and there's one that's called core downloader. And these cores are basically all the emulators that run within RetroArch. You can basically pick and choose which ones you want to download. So I'm going to go through here and download all of the cores of the games that I put onto my flash drive. And all the listing in the written guide in my video description, which will show you all the RetroArch cores that I recommend, as well as the standalone emulators, which we'll show later in the video. So if you have any question about what things are going to work and which ones you should download, I would check out my written guide. So anyway, now that you've downloaded all the cores you're going to use, let's go back into Import Content Manual Scan. Now under Default Core, you're going to see all the cores that you downloaded. So let's pick the Game Boy Advance one. And really, those are the only three parameters we're going to need. So scroll down and select Start Scan. Now if we go back to the main menu, you can see Game Boy Advance here on the left. Not only that, if you have these games named correctly, as you scroll through, you're actually going to see some box art for them. It might take a minute to download, but they'll show up. And just like that, Game Boy Advance works great. Now bear in mind, I have BIOS installed on this device, that's why you see the Game Boy logo. Okay, now that we've verified that a game will boot, let's actually close out of the game and let's make some adjustments to the graphics. So to get out of a game, you can go ahead and press Select and Start, or you can press Select and X to get into the RetroArch menu again, and then select Close Content. Now that we're back in the main RetroArch with no game loaded, let's go into Settings, and then Video, and then Scaling. And in here, we're going to select integer scaling. It might make the screen a little bit smaller around the edges, but overall, it's going to make things more balanced. And this is what I prefer. And of course, we're going to save the current configuration. Now, we're going to go back into that game, and as we boot it up, you can see that there's a little bit of black bars around the Game Boy logo here. So it's a little bit smaller on your screen, but honestly, it's going to look a lot better, and I would recommend doing this. Especially if you want to avoid any sort of pixel distortions. But anyway, as you can see, Game Boy Advance runs just fine on this, 60 frames per second solid. So let's go ahead and add another system. We're going to go back into Manual Scan, and then this time we're going to select Game Boy Color. And so here we'll change out the directory and the name of the system, as well as the core that we're going to use to launch it. And again, we're just going to do Start Scan. And there we go, now we have Game Boy Color listed. So I would just recommend going through this same process for all the other systems you want to show in RetroArch. And so testing out Game Boy Color here, you can see it works just great. Now the Fire Stick actually supports HDR gaming, so it's actually showing this in HDR right now on my monitor. And of course you can turn that off if you'd like, it's really going to be up to you. Okay, so moving along here, let's try just the regular Game Boy now. And when you start a game, you might see that it's in black and white. So let me show you how to change that. You can go down to the RetroArch menu, and then Options. And then under Game Boy Colorization, change that to Internal. Also, I recommend going down to the Interframe Blending section and change that to LCD Ghosting Accurate. This is going to better replicate the screen of the original Game Boy. And this is what it looks like here. It's a little bit too green on this monitor here, so I'm going to change it out for a different version of the colorization. So under Internal Palette, you can change it as something else. I really like one called Special One. And there we go. It looks pretty good. 
And of course this game runs well too. You might see a little bit of slowdown here and there, but that's actually based on the pixel limitations of the Game Boy itself. It is accurately showing the slowdown you would expect when playing a Game Boy game. Okay, moving over to NES, I'm just gonna play some game at random here. I'm not even looking. I'm just got my eyes closed. I'm selecting a game here, and this is this one here. I've never heard of this game, but it seems to be pretty good. Rather than try to figure out what the heck game this is, let's just try it out. And it looks like it's playing well, 60 frames per second solid. So let's actually try out a different game, one I've actually played before, and this is Contra, and it runs really well too. So really, any Game Boy Advance, Game Boy Color, Game Boy, or Nintendo game you throw at this thing, it's gonna do just fine. Let's up the ante a little bit and try out Super Nintendo. And Super Nintendo runs really well, although I am detecting a little bit of input lag. And this is a really easy fix, let me show you how to do that real quick. Go back into the RetroArch menu, then back out into the settings section, and then go into latency, and then select run ahead to reduce latency. And so just turn that on and then keep the number of frames to run ahead to one. Now we can resume the game and the controls are much better this way. It just feels a lot more responsive. For this game in particular, the test I like to do to make sure the input lag is working correctly, it's actually this point right here. I like to jump on the bullet itself and then see if I can get up to where the one up mushroom is. And look at that, this is working really well. Honestly, not a lot of systems can run this latency very well, and so the fact that the Fire Stick can do it so well is a really good indication that we're going to see better performance down the line. So once you've decided you want to use this latency option for the future Super Nintendo games, what you want to do is go back into the Quick Menu, and then select Overrides, and then Save Core Overrides. This means that anytime you load up a Super Nintendo game with the SNES 9X Core, it's going to have that Run Ahead feature enabled. And that's going to make playing platformers and things like that really easy. But just bear in mind, this does have a performance cost, and there's going to be a couple games that aren't going to work well with it. A good example is Super Mario World 2. As you can see here, just in the opening menu, it's getting down to 4950 frames per second. And even as you're playing it, I can definitely feel that the latency is really good, but I'm also detecting some slowdown. So it's going to be up to you. Are you willing to live with a little bit of slowdown, but having really nice controls, or would you rather not have the slowdown at all? So once you've kind of mulled that over and decided which way you want to go, let me show you how to set that up. We're going to go back into the RetroArch menu while the game is loaded, go into settings and then latency and then turn off the run ahead. Now if we want to save that for just this game, we're going to go back into the quick menu, then overrides, and then select save game overrides. This basically means that every other game is going to use run ahead except for Mario World 2. And as you can see here, even at the main title screen, it's staying at a stable 60 frames per second. So problem resolved. Okay, let's try out some other systems. Sega Genesis works wonderfully on this. This one is a little bit easier to emulate than Super Nintendo, so you're not going to run into any issues when it comes to performance. Same thing with Sega CD. Sega CD runs really well, as well as Sega 32X. All told, every 16-bit system is going to play really well, even some of the more obscure ones. For example, here's TurboGrafx CD. If you've ever wanted to play through Castlevania Rondo of Blood, you know, which is kind of a predecessor to Castlevania Symphony of the Night, this is going to be a really great way to play it. And you're in for a treat. This is an awesome game. So in addition to some of these home consoles, you can also play arcade games. Everything from classic games like Galaga, to a little bit more modern games like Cadillacs and Dinosaurs. And of course it doesn't stop there. You can play mid-90s fighting games, things like Marvel vs. Capcom and even some of the later 90s arcade games too, like Street Fighter III Third Strike. You're not going to be able to play every game under the sun, but for the most part, all of these work really well. I didn't find any performance issues with any games leading up to CPS 3. Okay, so let's move on to some of the harder systems here. We'll start with PlayStation 1. This is still in RetroArch here, and we're using the PCSX rearmed core. And as you can see, it's staying at a stable 60 frames per second. And every PlayStation game that I threw at it performed admirably. As you can see here, Tekken 3, one of the hardest PS1 games to play, is running perfectly. And I think this would be a great opportunity to run through some of those older PlayStation role-playing games. For example, things like Final Fantasy VIII. I never actually finished this game back in the day, so this might be an option for me to sit down on the couch and run through it one final time. So long story short, PlayStation 1 works really well on this. Let's kick it up a notch, try something harder. How about Nintendo 64? We're still in RetroArch here, and as you can see, some of the Nintendo 64 games are playing really well. The intro sequence of Majora's Mask will often give you issues when you start to try to chop the grass, and as you can see here, it's staying at a stable 19-20 frames per second, which is what the game originally ran at. 
So all in all, if you wanted to play either of the Zelda games on your TV, this is going to be a great option. Now in RetroArch, not every Nintendo 64 game is going to play well. For example, here's F-Zero X, and as you can see, it is dipping down quite a bit. You're getting about 54 frames per second in some parts. And not only that, it does have some audio stuttering too, so not perfect gameplay. If we push it even further to some of the harder games like Cruisin' USA or Conker's Bad Fur Day, you're going to see some significant slowdown here. But that's actually not the end of the world because there are standalone Nintendo 64 emulators that we can try out instead. Now it gets a little tricky here because you don't have access to the Google Play Store here, so you have to actually grab the APK from elsewhere. And so you're going to have to basically Google the name of the emulator plus the word APK and go to a shady website and download that APK file. But after you've gone through and done this process via the downloader app, you're going to be able to play things like the Moopin 64 Plus FC emulator. And the nice thing is that this is going to pull from those same game files that we're using with RetroArch. You don't have to download different games for the different emulators. And now let's try out Cruisin' USA with this app instead. And sadly, performance isn't perfect, but this is a really hard game to emulate. Either way, we're getting probably a good 5 frames per second faster than we were on RetroArch, so that's a win. And if we move over to some of those typical middle tier Nintendo 64 games, things like F-Zero X, it's going to run flawlessly. And so yeah, I would say that GoldenEye and Conker's Bad Fur Day and Cruisin' USA, they're not going to play very well on this system, but just about everything else is probably going to play pretty decently. I would say confidently that 90% of Nintendo 64 games are going to play on this Fire Stick. But if you're holding out for those last 10% of games, then maybe you're going to want to get something more powerful. But for the price point, I think this is really impressive. This system is not meant to emulate games in any way. It's meant to stream media. And all the same, we're able to emulate games, and I love that fact. But of course, I'm not just satisfied with Nintendo 64. Let's try out some other systems. So the next one in the hopper is Sega Saturn. Again, going back to RetroArch, you can see it's not running at full speed. We're getting about 32 frames per second. This is definitely too slow to be playable, in my book at least. But again, there are standalone apps that you can download in the same way that we got the Nintendo 64 one. So here's the standalone Yabasan Shiro emulator. We're running at a 1x resolution here, and it's running relatively smoothly. Now, bear in mind that this emulator uses an auto frame skip by default, so there is some frame skipping going on. But all the same, if you got a real hankering to playing Sega Saturn games on a budget, this is going to be a pretty good example. You're going to have to deal with frame skip. This is Panzer Dragoon, also running with a little bit of frame skip, but relatively smooth. This is an enjoyable experience. It's not a perfect emulation experience, but it's pretty close. Even some of the most hard games to play on Saturn, things like Sega Rally Championship, for the most part run at full speed. Again, you're going to have some frame skipping going on, but it's going to be up to you whether or not this is tolerable. But Sega Saturn has always been a pain in the butt to emulate. Let's try some stuff that's actually a little bit easier. And paradoxically, the next generation system from Sega, the Dreamcast, runs better than Saturn. This is using the ReDream emulator, the non-pro standard version here, with no upscaling. But at a native resolution of 640x480, you can see it's running at a very good pace. All in all, I was really surprised with how well Dreamcast played on this little machine. Honestly, I only put a couple Dreamcast games on my flash drive initially because I was like, there's no way this thing can play Dreamcast. And then I loaded up my first Dreamcast game and it ran at full speed and I was like, holy crap, I couldn't believe it. And so this was the moment where I was like, okay, we need to get word out about how emulation works so well on the Amazon Fire Stick. Because when I bought this thing for testing, Dreamcast was not in the cards. I was hoping they could maybe do a few Nintendo 64 games. So all in all, I'm pleasantly surprised with how well this performs, even when we get to Dreamcast. But we're not done here. I have one more system I want to try out, and this is going to be Sony PSP. And surely there's no way this one can work. Now luckily, you can actually get the APK for the PSP emulator directly from the official website, which makes things just much easier to download. Once you've got the app installed, let's start playing some games. We're going to start with some of the harder stuff first. Let's do OutRun 2006. This is running at 2x resolution with no frame skip, and you can see that it definitely is not playing at full speed. We're getting somewhere around 38 frames per second. So here we can do one of two things. The first is to go into the settings and reduce the resolution from 2x resolution to 1x resolution. This is going to run everything on the native resolution that was on the original PSP screen. And honestly, this fixes gameplay in OutRun 2006. It's running at full speed now. There's a dip every once in a while, but for the most part, it's playing really well. The only issue here is that at a 1x resolution on a big TV, it's going to look very pixelated. You know, this is meant to be played on a very small screen. So let's go in and double the resolution, but then turn on auto frame skip. And we'll turn it on to just an auto frame skip of 1. 
And here you can see it's running at basically 100% speed, but obviously with that frame skip, it's not going to be quite as smooth. Again, that's going to be up to you what you can tolerate. And really, this isn't going to be mandatory for most games. For example, with Virtual Tennis World Tour, you actually don't need frame skip at all. It runs at a 2x resolution with no problem. Same thing with other games like Soul Calibur Broken Destiny. It's running really well at a 2x resolution too. So depending on the game, you're going to have to mess around with the frame skip and the resolution to figure out what works for you. But all in all, I would say that Sony PSP is entirely playable here on the Amazon Fire Stick. And this was my most pleasant surprise. I really wasn't expecting to be able to play PSP on something so cheap. And so really, this is kind of the end of the video here. I just wanted to show off what this device can actually do. And I'm really impressed with the Fire TV Stick 4K Max. I'm not too sure about the other Fire Sticks. You know, I know there are cheaper versions out there and the older ones, but at least this one, the most expensive and most modern version, is playing really well. And so yeah, for $55, I would say it's totally worth it. But all the same, I would keep an eye out for sales. You know, Black Friday is coming up here soon and Amazon periodically puts their things on sale. Either way, if you're on the hunt for a media streaming device and you want to play some games on it, I don't think you're going to find a better deal than this Fire TV Stick. And so that's it for this video. Be sure to check out the written guide I have in the video description to give you a list of emulators that I recommend. But other than that, let me know if you have any questions in the comments below, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming!